Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. Um, I'm here with my co-host Chandler Klebs, who's actually in Lee's Summit, Missouri, and he's going to be joining us in about 15 minutes. This is episode number 204, uh, Free Will Belief and Unconscious Decisions. Okay, so basically in this episode, we're going to explain how we think that our conscious mind, our free will, is making decisions when actually all of our decisions are made at the level of our unconscious mind. Okay, that's the theme. Now, just before we do that, why is this show important? Um, don't take my word for it. There's like an eminent American philosopher, John Searle, um, cited number 1314 in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as the most cited U.S. well um, philosopher post 1900. You know, not modern philosophers. So anyway, the key was asked. You know, if our world came to understand that free will is an illusion, came to accept it, acknowledge it, what would this mean? And Searle said that would be, I'm quoting, a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Galileo or Newton or Darwin. It would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe, end quote. And he's right about that. I mean, like, our world is completely deluded. We think things are up to us. Absolutely nothing is up to us. That's the reality. Einstein understood this. Charles Darwin understood this. Sigmund Freud understood this. These, these three guys are probably our, our world's top thinkers. So again, this hasn't filtered out to the masses yet, but this is the purpose of this show. You know, my colleagues and I are actually pioneering this, this shift in human consciousness from a, a completely deluded state to, to sanity. It's kind of like, you know, like we, we once thought that, like, that the sun revolved around the earth. Now we know that we revolve around the sun. We once, once thought that the earth was flat. Now we know that it's an orb. You know, we ha we've had these kinds of like illusions before. We overcome them. We once, we once thought there was like Adam and Eve in a garden and a talking serpent. Now we know that we evolved from life forms, you know, four billion years ago, whatever. Um, all right, so let me get to the how, how the unconscious, the fact that we have an unconscious makes free will impossible. Okay, now, the unconscious has like several definitions and consciousness has about 20 def different definitions, but we're gonna go with the most basic, the ones that most people mean when they say them. All right, so the unconscious is the part of our mind that they, we call it the unconscious because we are not conscious of it. We're not aware of it. It, it, it resides below the level of consciousness. Not, think of all everything that you know. Okay, think of all the facts you've ever learned. They're not in your mind right now. You're not, they're not all, you're not aware of them all. You couldn't possibly be, but they reside as memories in your unconscious. Okay, so now we're, we're starting off with a definition of what the unconscious is. Now let's understand what consciousness is. Consciousness is simply awareness. Right now, you're aware of the sound of my voice. You're aware of my image on your um, TV or on, on, you know, if you're watching this on the internet. You're aware of various things. Consciousness is awareness. So the first key, key point is consciousness is not a data storage mechanism. In other words, like, our consciousness is not where we store memories. Because think about it, if we stored memories in our conscious mind, that, mean, that, means, that would mean that we're, we would be aware of, like, you know, millions of different kinds of, like, memories um, at the same time, and that's impossible. All right, so the first key fact is that consciousness is limited to awareness. All right, now here's the thing. So let's say you want to make a decision about anything, about whether to eat an apple or a pear, okay? Now, your memory of, like, of what, what a, an apple tastes like, what a pear tastes like, are not stored in your conscious mind. Because, again, your conscious mind is just about awareness. It's, it's fleeting. It goes like, you know, you might be aware of, of um, something at one moment, then you're aware of something else. The, the consciousness is like that, but it's always in the present moment. So, like, th these memories of what a pear and an apple taste like are stored in your unconscious. Now, remember, keep in mind that our conscious mind, our awareness, is not is not able to access our unconscious. In other, again, we call the unconscious a level of, of so, so what happens is like, if our, un, if our conscious mind can't access that information, the only part of our mind that has these memories of what a pear and an apple tastes like is the unconscious, okay? So like the data for making this decision of whether to eat a pear or an apple is in the unconscious. Now the other thing is the process, if, if, if if the data is in the unconscious, you know, about this and every other decision. Again, like, you know, we make decisions based on 
information, you know, if the rational, even emotional decisions are based on information. So like if, if, this, if this data is in our unconscious mind, then not only, then the processing of the da data has to be. In other words, like our conscious mind can't dig into the unconscious, you know, and, 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 um, and make decisions because again, um, it's just limited to awareness. So what's happening, what's happening is that think of your mind as, as basically being the unconscious. I mean, like all, all the processes by which you decide, the principles by which you decide, the data upon which you decide, that's all our unconscious mind. Now think of, um, think within all this like unconsciousness, there's like a flashlight. You, you um, flash a flashlight somewhere like to one concept, to one thought, to whatever, that's consciousness. So, so basically consciousness is the unconscious at its discretion, not at our free will discretion, choosing to make certain things aware, you know, to, to make things appear to our consciousness. Okay, so, so like, how does this relate to free will? I mean, like, if all our decisions are made at the level of un our unconscious, and then our unconscious, when it's made the decision, makes us aware of what's decided, there's, you know, there's no room for free will there. Something that we're not, you know, we're obviously not in control of our unconscious because we're not even aware of it. You know, we know, it's, we, know we have an unconscious from countless experiments in psychology. Uh, experiments, for example, um, they will like, they'll put, a, uh, they'll put a picture of a library on, um, on a wall and have two people talk, right? And these two people will, will talk more quietly than, than if the, the picture of the library wasn't there, okay? They're doing this unconsciously. They're not aware that they're talking more quietly. But again, we have like volumes of studies that demonstrate that we have an unconscious that we're not aware of. So again, the key point is like, if our unconscious is making our decisions, you know, they can't be freely willed because first, we're not aware of the unconscious and second, we, um, we can't control it. Okay, now... I want to go to an, to an experiment to explain this, like how they, they've actually explained, explained this, um, they've proved this pretty much um, neurologically. Back in 1983, uh, this guy, Benjamin Lebet, or LeBay, he did an experiment where he hooked up a, a subject to a, an EEG and an electromyogram to, muscle, um, uh, to measure muscle activity. Now, he asked the person to flick the, his finger, to decide when to flick the finger, right? And there was a clock on the wall, and he was instructed to tell the researchers the exact moment he decided to flick the finger, right? So, so they, again, they've got the, the electroencephalogram um, measuring brain activity, the electromyogram measuring mu muscle activity, and so they conduct the experiment, and what they discover is, like, there is actually unconscious activity that, that, is, um, that is basically demonstrates that the muscle movement is irrevocably be, um, is, is about to occur completely before the person is aware of consciously having made the decision to move the, the finger. Again, that, this experiment demonstrated that like about half a second before the person was aware of making his decision to flick the finger, there was actually unconscious brain activity that had already made that decision. Now you might think, as some critics have said, well, you know, half a second isn't all that much. There might have been something wrong with the machinery and all. But this, this experiment has been replicated um, numerous times with much more advanced imaging technology like functional MRIs, you know. And more recently, like some, a team of, of researchers found that they could detect, they could predict for example, if a person was going to uh, press button A or button B, they can predict that with over 60, perhaps 70 percent accurately, about 10 seconds, 7 to 10 seconds before the person was aware of their decision. All right, so again, not only do we have this theori theoretical, you know, um, definition-based understanding of why our decisions must be based at the level of the unconscious, we also have empirical it's proof. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's not even like, you know, some, some things you can prove, some things you can't. This is proof. There's no way that we could be freely willing something when, when our unconscious, when our unconscious activity is detected before the decision, before we're aware of having made our decision. All right. So, again, this is like, you know, so this is one way of understanding why um, our unconscious 
and not our conscious mind um, determines our decisions. All right, let, is there another way to explain this? All right, yeah, they're, they have other experiments. For example, this is good. This is like, um, uh, and, and a lot of these experiments kind of like show us that the reasons we think we're doing things are not really why we're doing things. For example, they, they hypnotize this guy, and um, the, the researcher gives the guy a post-hypnotic suggestion. He says, like, you know, when the, when the phone rings, I want you to go over to the, um, to the window, to the windowsill. I want you to grab a plant that's there, a potted plant. I want you to take it, cover it up with a piece of cloth, put it on the sofa in the room, and then bow to it three times, okay? Lo and behold, the guy comes out of hypnosis. The telephone rings. He goes to the window, picks up the plant, covers it, puts it on the sofa, and bows to it three times. Now here's the thing. Then he's asked, why did you do this? You know, the guy has no, absolutely no awareness that he'd been hypnotized to do that, that he'd been given this post-hypnotic suggestion. So he invents a, 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 he says, well, you know, like I was looking at the plant and it seemed kind of cold <laughs> over by the window. So I decided to move it away and, and cover it, you know, to keep it warmer. And then, you know, I figured, well, let's, let's put it um, on the sofa where it's warmer, you know, so not back on the windowsill. And then I felt so proud of myself that I bowed to the plant three times. This is, I'm not making this up. This is an actual experiment. Um, so again, there, there are volumes, there are dozens and dozens, hundreds, perhaps thousands, probably thousands of experiments that demonstrate that when we decide things, um, we think we're deciding them of our free will consciously, but actually it's unconscious factors that are, are, are making us do what we do. Okay, now this is like, you know, this is interesting because, like, you know, some people believe that, well, we make our decisions consciously. But no, what's happening is, like, again, the decision is made at the level of the unconscious because that's where the data is. That's where all our memories are. Again, our unconscious is, is the only part of our mind, you know, that's where our memories are stored. You know, again, consciousness, remember, consciousness is just awareness. You know, we're, we're aware of what's going on. And we're aware of what we're hearing. We're aware of what we're thinking. We're aware of what we're feeling and, and, and the temperature in the room and all. But that's, <clears throat> that's a different kind of experience than committing that stuff to memory. Like, let's say, um, let's say I think the number 346, okay? And so, like, if I want to commit that to memory, okay, I'll, I'll commit it to my 346, but right now I'm talking about other things, and as I'm talking about other things, that number is not in, in my conscious mind. So, like, if I've remembered it well enough, and it's not really up to me, it's up to my unconscious, you know, but we, we can, it's not like we can't train ourselves to do this, we can, but like, all right, so 346, so I may, I, I, I think I remember that correctly, but as I'm talking now, that, that number is not in my conscious mind. Um, it's stored in our unconscious. So, so what happens is, let's say I have to retrieve that number again. Let's say somebody tonight asked me, what was the number that, um, that you um, said on the show earlier? Okay, um, that number wasn't, didn't reside in my consciousness all the way from, from now till tonight, right? That number was stored in the unconscious, right? And that, that, that's an example of how all our memories are. They're not in our conscious mind 24-7, because again, we're, our consciousness is just like about what we're experiencing. So, so apply that example to anything. If we're gonna decide where to go to college, what, what to have for dinner, you know, what movie to see and all that, these decisions are all based on data that's stored in our unconscious. So clearly, obviously, if the data is stored in our conscious, and if we don't have control of our unconscious, we can't have a free will. Um, I should have explained this um, earlier, but see, if I had a free will, I would have. The, the, belief, the belief in free will is the belief that we, with nothing that's not out of our control, are deciding what to do. You know, we are deciding, it's, what we do is up to us, and nothing that's not in our control is making us decide. Now clearly, if we have an unconscious where all our data is stored that's actually making the decisions, and if we're not even aware of the unconscious, let alone in control of it, you have a part of our mind that we're not in control of deciding for us, that makes free will impossible. All right, now, um, 
We've got about 36 seconds, so like this show is important. I mean, the, uh, our last episode was about how like the belief in free will just limits our happiness. It, it just it creates a lot of hostility, a lot of blame, a lot of self-blame. It just creates a lot of problems. And this this series, like this show number 204, this is about like helping people understand. So we can like shift to a new consciousness. Imagine humanity overcoming this belief in free will. We can create a much better world by doing this. Okay, thanks for watching again. Chandler is going to join us. He's going to end the show. And we'll be back to explain this again uh, in the future. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Chandler Klebs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have an unconscious part of our mind or brain and how this may help people understand that free will is an illusion. See, people, when they um, try to take credit or blame or moral responsibility for their choices, they believe that it's a conscious choice. They tend to think, well, I consciously did this and I was aware of what I was doing, you know. And so we tend to blame people less who have a certain mental illness or a brain tumor or something like that. But understanding that all of us all the time already have um, an unconscious um, that makes our decisions and then feeds that decision to the conscious part of our brain and then become, on becoming aware, we think we consciously chose it. Well, this is revolutionary stuff. I mean... Now, uh, from what George has already said, this is commonly accepted in like psychology and neuroscience, and yet it was actually something quite new to me. You know, George actually introduced me to the topic because I knew nothing about psychology. Um, but upon inspecting my own life, I've I've realized, well, yes, this is true because. A fine example um, are certain songs that pop into my head from video games I played years ago or a movie I watched years ago or even recently. And I can offer no explanation why it's one song instead of another. So that's very, very important to understand is that we are not aware of why we're doing what we're doing. I'm not aware of why I'm singing or whistling a certain song. Sam Harris in his book mentioned he's not aware of why he wants um, coffee or, or more than tea or tea more than coffee. You know, we can't offer explanations for these things because we're neither aware of them nor in control of them. And it's fairly straightforward how you're not in control of something you're not even aware of, right? I should think that would be obvious. Okay, so basically, um, all our memories are stored in the unconscious. They're stored in regions of our brain and we aren't able to just pick out the memories that we want at a certain time because they pop up when we least expect and we try to remember someone's name or someone's phone number or something like that, but we forget. Um, so here's the deal. We don't have this type of control or access to the unconscious um, part of our brain where our memories are stored like we do with a computer where we can just, you know, create, delete files, all that sort of stuff. That would be more convenient. So in a sense, we our brains are extremely unreliable machines that compared to modern com computers that humans built are actually quite useless. <laughs> So I find that a little bit funny, but I, I like this understanding that we have an unconscious and how things are happening um, at the unconscious level and decisions are made by memories and prior causes of which we're not even aware. Because it's kind of cool, but it's a little bit scary. So some people may be resistant to this information. Um, so here's the deal. If we don't attribute people... Um, we don't attribute moral responsibility or free will to people who are not aware of what they're doing, such as in the case of mental illness or something like that. Um, well, considering that none of us truly are aware of what we're doing. I mean, we may be a sort of aware of what we're doing while we're doing it. We may be thinking, we may even be thinking, oh yeah, I'm doing this at the time we're doing something. 
But the decision to do that thing and the reasons behind it are not available to us. I particularly found George's example funny about the guy who was told when the phone rings to, to take the plant from the window um, over to the, the couch and bow to it three times. And, you know, he was asked why he did that. And he, and he made up an answer because he didn't know, which is, which is a very interesting thing because you have to wonder when someone does that. Is it because they're afraid to admit they don't know so they make something up? Or is, or is the explanation he made up something else that his unconscious mind made up, you know, as an explanation to feed to his consciousness as the explanation to give of why he did that. But he had no idea it was a post-hypnotic suggestion. So here's the deal, people, is that <laughs> we don't know what we're doing. We really don't have a clue what it is, why we're doing what we're doing. We, I mean, we see that we're doing something, but the process of the decision-making actually kind of happens um, at a prior level. You know, it's sort of like, you know, this can be applied to so many situations, but it's sort of like um, we don't assume that individuals are responsible in a company. Like, for example, when um, the managers, um, the higher up managers in a company make decisions, okay, well, we're going to have this dress code, we're going to have this rule and all this stuff. Well, then, you know, your supervisors, for example, they're not, they're not the ones making the decisions. They're just someone who is conscious and informing you of that decision. But you don't attribute moral responsibility to that person. Now, of course, you would end up attributing uh, the higher up people to be um, responsible. And yet they're really not either. <laughs> they're unconscious is. And, and it's, it's really interesting how, how you look at this unconscious thing. And I mean, I think, yeah, um, this is an entryway for people to perhaps get into psychology and neuroscience and think, well, how are decisions made at the level of the brain, which is worth studying. Um, but yeah, this is a very interesting one because basically we identify, like humans tend to identify as being their conscious mind. They think, well, this conscious mind is me. My consciousness, this is me. And, you know, there's all sorts of thing related beliefs about consciousness um, that, that it survives death and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, I don't want to get too off topic. Um, the point is, we identify with our conscious mind, what we're conscious of at, at the moment. Therefore, you know, our heart is beating at a certain speed. Our, our, all our blood cells are, are moving around in our body. All our cells, all of our internal organs are functioning as they do. And yet, we're not aware of how this is happening. I don't even know where a lot of my internal organs are. I'm terrible at anatomy. But they're working, which gives me the feeling that me as a conscious thing, if the consciousness is me, is not controlling those things, nor would it know how. It's kind of a strange thing. So we don't identify with the whole of our bodies, you know, it, it, because we don't feel like, well, that's, that's my genes or that's my hormones making me do that. You know, so yeah, we, we don't identify, we only identify a certain specific conscious part of us um, as the self. And then here's the fun part is that we attribute free will um, or agency or moral responsibility to that particular one conscious part, which is really only a tiny fraction, but it's really more like the last domino in a sense, because it, like with the chain of dominoes, you know, one domino knocks over the other, knocks over the other. And it's sort of like um, the last domino is being hit by the next to last domino. And it's thinking, well, I consciously chose to fall over, 
but really it was it was pushed over by a whole bunch of prior unconscious processes and then it becomes aware that it's falling over while it's falling over so essentially um, we're like dominoes that are falling over and taking credit for when you fall in the right direction and we blame other dominoes for falling in the wrong direction which basically reveals our insanity but the good news our insanity about our decision making process is not our fault and seriously a lot of us believe that we consciously make decisions because I guess from a certain standpoint it feels like that maybe maybe it feels when when you're making a so-called decision you know like do you want paper or plastic you know or are you gonna vote for this person or that person or do you want or do you want potatoes or carrots for breakfast you know when someone asks us one of these one of these questions we we we, we may be conscious, oh, well, I want this food because it tastes better, or you know what I mean? And we may be conscious of some of those reasons, even though we may not be conscious of all the reasons and the process of how it's done. But we kind of feel like we consciously choose, but if psychology and neuroscience are correct, well, then no, we don't. We've been wrong about making conscious choices. And this is important to understand because um yeah to to make the claim that we have free choices and that we could have done otherwise it sort of requires um not only being conscious of all that is 100 percent of the factors going into that choice but it also requires you to have complete control and be able to manipulate those in any way you like. Sam Harris said something similar in his book. Um, anyway, um, yeah, this has been my explanation of how we make choices unconsciously, not consciously, and how we're not even aware of what we're doing and cannot be morally responsible for it. So I hope you enjoyed that. and. George Ortega and I will be back for more episodes in the future. Hope you found this educational and maybe a little entertaining. So that's what I have to say about it for now. Uh, thank you for listening, and I guess this is goodbye. Uh -huh.